All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me pull this up. Thank you all for waiting uh, for this beginning of the webinar. Um, I'm really excited that you're all tuning in to today's webinar on lessons learned deploying LLMs into production with Langsmith. Um, we've got a lot of material here to get through since um, all these people bring a wealth of experience. So I'll keep the intros short and then I'll go over a couple of ground rules laying out what we're going to go through today. Um, I'm excited to invite some amazing guests to the webinar today. We've got um, Takigami and we've got WeChat. Um, so from Takigami, we've got um, Jean Pauli uh, and uh, Taki Jeffrey. Uh, John is the, John is the um, uh, CEO of Dokigami and co-creator of the XML standard. Um, so he brings a wealth of experience in uh, delivering invaluable products uh, across a number of different areas. And then Tucky is a co-founder and head of product and is leading a lot of the efforts to bring a number of LLM-powered features to Dokigami from document authoring to extraction and more. Um, Emil is a lead engineer at ReChat, the, uh, the company that puts all the tools real estate agents need within one super app. Um, Emil is overseeing the development of Lucy, a conversational entry point to all the functionality of ReChat using an LLM powered API. Um, before we dive in, I want to say a few points of order. Each presenter will have roughly 25 minutes to provide um, the, the content that they want to share and then go through their slides. We'll do our best to reserve about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, for everyone in the audience, I would encourage you to be posting your questions to the chat and I'll be monitoring them. If there's things that I feel like they're best addressed in real time, I'll try to raise them and, and interrupt a little bit there. Um, otherwise, if you don't have um, your answer, your question answered today, we'll be recording this session and sharing it on YouTube and other places. So hopefully we'll be able to follow up with a little bit more information for you there if we don't have time. And um, with that, I would like to turn it over first to Dakigami. Wonderful. Thank you, Will, for that intro. Let me just share my screen. Hopefully that works. And please let me know when my screen is live. I see it here. OK. You folks see my screen? Yep. OK. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We are Dakigami. And uh, we will be sharing some lessons that we've learned uh, deploying LLMs into production. And we're super proud uh, to share um, you know, all these lessons we've been learning working together with Langchain and, and the Langsmith team since the beginning of the, the Langsmith beta. Uh, so uh, we only have around 20 minutes. So we're going to go pretty fast. And uh, Dakigami is actually quite different from other systems. So we'll spend a little bit of time explaining as we go. Uh, we have a lot of code to share as well. Uh, so we'll sort of start with the explanations and then we'll jump into code. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, these four real life challenges here. We'll go into more detail as we go. Uh, we have some code uh, that even if we can't get into the code in the 20 minutes today, we will share links so you folks can follow the code along afterwards. Um, and then we'll try to summarize at the end how we do end-to-end -end LLM ops uh, with our language models in production um, over the last few years. Okay, so with that, um, so I think, Will, you already did um, a fantastic intros. Thank you, but maybe uh, you folks want to say hello. Uh, Jean, Mike, uh, Zubin, go ahead, please. Yeah, I know uh, this is Jean Pauli. Thank you, really, Will and uh, Langchain. Uh, it's an amazing framework. So thank you for inviting us. Please. Yeah, and you know, Jean built this little thing called XML. And if you've used DocX and XLSX, um, you know, you've you've seen a little bit of his work. Uh, Mike, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, hey, uh, you know, like John said, I want to echo, you know, thank you for inviting us to speak today. Um, yeah, I have a background at Microsoft, uh, you know, been at Dakigami as a co-founder for a little over five years now. So, yeah, just excited uh, to speak with everyone today. Thanks. Yeah, and Mike can answer a lot of questions that people might have over, you know, running these models uh, on GPUs, sort of at scale inference, et cetera. Mike's, Mike's, your, Mike's the guy. Uh, Zubin, please. Hey, Langchain community. Uh, I'm on the product team here at Dokigami. Been here about four years. Uh, been uh, making documents more useful and understandable for the last 20 plus years. And uh, looking forward to sharing our knowledge with you all. Awesome. So uh, as I said, we're going to be talking about a series of challenges uh, that we ran into uh, at Dokigami deploying LLMs at scale. And of course, 
at Dakigami, we uh, we're a document engineering company. Uh, we build a pipeline to understand and create uh, real world documents. And very quickly, what we realized is real world documents are not just flat text, right? So there's a lot of great uh, tools out there, uh, but what you realize is it is it's sometimes challenging to detect things like headings and you know sort of these structural elements. Like here, you see an inline heading. Here, you see actually in this document, it's a two column layout, so the text actually flows from one column to the other. Um, it's even harder in this case because there's a table that actually flows across the two columns, and you know you have these sort of key value pairs. So in Dakigami, this is just a screenshot of the Dakigami system. You folks can try it later if you want. Uh, what we do here, as we know, with LLMs, I mean, the first thing you need to do is extract the text. Um, and then, you know, then off you go to the races. Uh, we have a few mitigations that we've learned. For example, we actually structurally chunk documents around these sort of structural limits that you're seeing. We stitch together the reading order using language models. And then uh, for retrieval augmented generation, uh, you know, rather than just naive tiling or text splitting, uh, we might, for example, just use actual paragraphs or actual table cells or rows. So here, uh, Jean, since you've been working with documents for a while, would you like to add anything? No, I just want to say, you know, um, if, if you look, uh, humans create documents in general, and so they convey their intent both in terms of layout and text. You know, it's they go together. That's why everybody talk about multimodal. Um, this is like all of this. Like if you think, for example, also the way we think about you know documents, it's hierarchical. So if you look at this B initial statement, and actually we look at it in Dokigami as all the stuff basically that's go around it here in this page is inside of the the kind of hierarchy that is represented by this B section. That, let's start with that, and I'm sure Taki would continue. Right, and I think. Uh... I have, I have code coming right after challenge one and challenge two to sort of tie it all together. But if if this first one, challenge one, is about essentially structurally chunking the document, challenge two is actually that the semantics of the document in terms of the concepts are also nested. So here, again, you'll notice that here's a landlord, uh, here's a tenant, uh, et cetera. And you know, a text-based system, I'm sure, could could extract something like this. But here you see the hierarchy sort of get more complex, right? So you have all the basic lease terms here, and then you have the commencement date over here. Um, and so maybe here, Zubin, you want to jump in because you work with a lot of uh, advanced lo uh, long form document types, how you've seen documents be knowledge graphs in, in, in real life. Yeah, I mean, this structural and semantic chunking that we do with this hierarchical awareness is enormously valuable in the real world. If you go over to the next uh, slide, Taki, where we talk about the XML representation, which is sort of the way we represent this in XML. Um, if you think about commercial insurance in the, in the world of, uh, of, say, employee benefits claims and employee benefits quotes, you'll see situations where you're de dealing with a document that has essentially potentially a dozen different plans. And each of these different plans have a different design. They have different classes. They have different networks. And all of this disambiguation is only possible if you have that hierarchical awareness to be able to know that the maximum out-of-pocket maximum over here pertains to a particular plan, a particular class, a particular network, and so on. And so this high signal retrieval that you can attain because of this hierarchical awareness is really essential to sort of drive great outcomes. So I just wanted to mention that as a sort of the implicit benefit here that comes through this. Awesome. So yeah. I think I, I actually if I can add one thing, Taki, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, a lot of people talk about chunking and just uh, the, 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 what we call the XML data model historically, but, you know, it, you can represent it in JSON and whatever markup language you want. It's basically think about it as chunks inside of chunks, very simply, chunks contain other chunks. And every chunk has a label which represents semantically what this chunk means. You know, if it's a start date, or is it an insurance number, or is it an entire you know section for uh, for negotiation? Just think about it. That's a very simple model. And then, in addition, 
we group documents that looks that like talks about similar things. Those documents should share similar labels, the same labels on their charts. Right. That's literally the nutshell of this yeah. model that, uh, that that scales very well. Right. So this was this is of course the you know the explanation. Uh, let's jump into a little bit of code. So you might have all seen uh, something like this from you know if you're if you're attending a LangChain seminar uh, or a webinar. So with retrieval augmented generation, you know. Pretty standard. We have a data loader for Dakigami. You can use any other data loader, uh, but our data loader, of course, chunks the way we just described, and it actually introduce puts metadata on all the chunks uh, using the XML knowledge graph that Jean was just talking about, and that actually allows you to do things that that are not possible otherwise. So, um, anybody following along can click this link uh, to to see the code I'm going to show you. In the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to go into too much detail, uh, but this is the code. Um, hopefully, you folks can see uh, that you know you can you can download and run yourself. And and here, uh, essentially, uh, you'll notice that in Dokigami, once you've processed a bunch of documents, you get a doc set ID. You can specify a doc set ID to the Dokigami loader, and the chunks that it returns have additional metadata on them. So this metadata right here is coming from that XML uh, knowledge graph that we were just talking about. So every chunk is actually richer than just the text embedding or the text contents of the chunk. And uh, I know I'm going pretty fast here, uh, just in the interest of time, but this allows us to do some pretty cool things with, uh, for example, the self-querying retriever. If uh, people in the audience don't uh, know about this, you can just click this link here. Uh, this is a LangChain concept. And uh, actually, in this code base, you'll notice that uh, I actually ask a question without the Dokigami metadata uh, using the self-querying retriever. And uh, because you know this is a LangSmith webinar, we can actually click on the trace and see what that looks like. And uh, so, you know, you ask a question like, what is the rentable area for the property owned by DHA group? And immediately you'll notice that the retriever did not return any documents. So that's a problem. I mean, so no wonder if the retriever did not return any documents. Of course, the answer to the question is, I don't know. But if you dig in a little bit, why did the retriever not return any documents? Well, it's because the self-querying retriever depends on, um, you know, the information that's in, on all the chunks. And here it's trying to filter by name, which essentially is the file name uh, by default for standard um, retrievers. And you know, there's just no file named DHA group. Like this piece of information, DHA group is actually uh, elsewhere in the document. It's not in the file name. Uh, so you know, without Dokigami, this question literally fails. But if all you do is you actually use the Dokigami chunks instead with the additional information uh, from the XML knowledge graph. Uh, well, it's now able to answer the question because now it's actually filtering not on the file name. Name is just the file name, uh, but it's actually filtering on landlord. And that 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 metadata landlord actually came from the XML knowledge graph. So if you can uh, look over here, you know you have the, the same question, but now it's actually found a bunch of documents in the in the vector database uh, using the self querying retriever, and now of course it's it's able to come up with the answer. So I invite you all to uh, to play around with this. It's actually pretty powerful. Um, and uh, of course, if you folks have any questions, uh, we'll address them um, in the in the Q and A section. So I'm going to go back now. Uh, these were essentially our first two challenges. You know, with with semantic uh, retrieval, with especially long form documents. Either there's texting, text extraction, and chunking problems, which we address. Uh, using our sort of structural chunking, and then sometimes there's you know these knowledge representation problems, and the knowledge graph is not rich enough. Uh, so Dokigami helps with that as well. Okay, so the third thing I'd like to talk about is actually something Will you helped us with, so uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, is you know in practice sometimes chains get very very complex. So if uh, people in the audience have been playing around with the LangChain expression language, um, this this will resonate with them. Um, I mean, it starts off with a very naive scenario, right? Like you have a database that you're trying to query with 
uh, natural language. Now at Dakigami, we do um, we do SQL as well as things like XQuery, et cetera, over, over XML. But just to simplify the scenario, imagine you have a question like this. And then of course you want to create the SQL query using the language model uh, by passing in the, you know, the table schema. Uh, but what if the SQL is invalid, right? Or has a, you know, has a small problem, like in this case, the table name is wrong. You run the SQL query, but you get some sort of an exception. And then, you know, what if you want to actually attempt a fix up, sort of like what agents do? Um, and then once, you know, the SQL has been fixed up uh, and you have your result, what if you want to do explanations of the result in sort of human natural language? Because this is not a great answer to give back to a user, right? You want to say something like, you know, the average sales were, you know, 400 and, you know, 51,000, et cetera. So the sample code is here. In the interest of time, I'm not going to click through the sample code in this case. Uh, but uh, you can all click here and sort of it, it walks through how you can do stuff like this, a more complicated chain, uh, without actually using an agent. Because in, in production, what we found is agents you know, use a lot of tokens. And some, some of the smaller models we use, we have our own custom model, uh, are not really tuned to the, the agent syntax. Uh, so we ended up doing things this way uh, for efficiency and performance. Uh, you guys can click the link here to find out. But what I will do is um, I will click through the Lang chain, uh, the Lang Smith trace, because you know that's that's what this webinar is about. And that's actually pretty cool because there's a lot of richness here that allows you to understand in Lang Smith what's going on. So I'm going to expand this and you know. Uh, um, Turn on the you know the time the run stats as well, and here you'll notice you can step through the entire thing that we were talking about. So for example, here we have a runnable sequence which is taking the question and generating the SQL itself. You can see how it's getting the table info, etc. We're using few shot prompt seeding, uh, so for in context learning, so you can uh, literally go in and see which examples the system found, um, you know, to generate the query. Uh, we have a bunch of output parsers uh, that you can look into as well, uh, et cetera. And then uh, the, the last thing that we were talking about, which is um, you know, uh, taking the output and running it in parallel. So rather than serially doing the explanations, doing it in parallel, well, that's a runnable map over here. As you can see, these, these two maps in parallel. And, and um, you know, uh, it's doing the explained SQL result as well as the explained SQL query. So the meta point here is these things get very, very complicated in real life when you deploy them, especially when you start doing things in parallel and have uh, retry logic built in, et cetera. Uh, but you know, Langsmith is a great way to debug that. So we're happy to take questions about this as well. I'm just looking at time. And uh, you know, this part, um, you know, we'll we'll follow up with a blog post with a lot of these links. But there's actually an art and the science to getting these traces to look good and be actionable. So Will, I think you wrote this cookbook. I linked it here, which has a lot of interesting tips around uh, naming your lambdas and passing config in uh, to conditionally invoke runnables, uh, just to make sure you know the nesting is correct. Um, and then I'm, I also linked some common failures that we've seen. So again, for example, this one was interesting. I just ran into this this morning. These are all public. You folks can browse around them. Where if, if something like this failed in production, how do we find out what actually happened? Well, in this case, it's you know the, there was a, this is a context overflow, right? So you, it's literally telling you what it is. It's a model error in this particular model, whatever it's running, et cetera. And, and so you can click around. Uh, this, this particular one, for example, is, is a case where the fix up did not work. You know the fix up logic that I'm talking about? Uh, so it was like the SQL was so broken that that it, it wasn't even able to fix that. It was a complicated schema. Uh, so this would be a case for, we'll talk about it at the end, of like actually building a data set and actually fine tuning your model uh, to operate better. Okay. And then I think uh, just to close it out, um, just only have a few more minutes, but I know we have a Q&A at the end, is how do we tie all this together into sort of an end-to-end -end LLM ops flow? So, so this is what we do, and we'd love to hear from others in the audience what what you folks do. Um, so we, as I said, have a you know a custom LLM deployed uh, 
for efficiency's sake, it you know it's a smaller model, fine tuned um, for smaller tasks, and a bigger model for some more complicated chat interactions. And then we regularly look at failed runs as well as end user disliked runs. In in the cookbook, there's a there's a way to you know wire up user feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down. And then whatever these problematic runs are, we actually add them to data sets in LangSmith. And then we actually fix the uh, fix these problematic runs. And here's a couple of tips here that we found are useful. Um, we actually use a larger LLM to propose the fixes to mistakes made by smaller LLMs. We do this offline right now. Um, so we might use like a 70 billion parameter model to, to, fi to fix up the mistakes of the smaller model. And then we also do a lot of post-processing. So whatever the fixed runs are, uh, we make sure they're syntactically correct. For example, X query is syntactically correct or the SQL is correct. And then, you know, fine tune the model and deploy it again. So here, uh, I'd like to just, you know, this is our last slide. Um, just like to call on Mike, uh, if you had any uh, nuggets to share because you do a lot of this work for us in terms of- Yeah, the thanks, Doc. Okay, I mean, I just, just quickly, you know, to pull back the curtain a little bit more about what our document processing pipeline looks like. Um, you know, we use Apache Spark as kind of like the, I guess I'd say the execution engine for all of this. Um, and then right now we're in the process. Yeah, we we host our LLMs locally. And what I mean by that is like, you know, in cluster, in the same Kubernetes cluster that we run the rest of uh, Takigami's code. Um, you know, right now we're in the process of rolling out NVIDIA Triton, you know, as kind of the platform to, to host these models on. Um, and, you know, for things like, uh, you know, for kind of like, I guess I'd say for vector database and caching and other things, we heavily use Redis. Um, uh, and so that's kind of a high level view of like what our technology stack looks like underneath, uh, all of this. Um, but yeah, happy to, you know, take more questions about that in the, in the Q and A. Right. So, so we'll, we're right at 955 when you asked us uh, to be. So are there any questions that you'd like us to address now, or should we wait till the end after? This is super, super cool. Um, I wanted to, I guess, follow up with a question and say, or first of all, commend the fact that I, I like this tactic of, of using a larger model offline in order to be fixing and helping reduce the amount of human labor to improve this, this pipeline. You've really set up a nice end-to-end -end flow to continuously improve everything. Um, and including some manual checks, including some of these like LLMs things. And so I'm sure a lot of people would have um, questions about this at the end. I guess leading up to this, would love to hear some of the like questions and other things um, that you've had around like uh, improving the few shot experience there, or, or like are there any techniques that you've been able to apply that have improved the average accuracy before fine tuning? Right. So yeah, no. What what we do right now is. Uh, Every 500 examples, we just take 50 of them, so 10%. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so every every 500 fixed runs, we take 10% of them and just add them to our uh, few shot learning set. And so if I go back here, uh, when we're running this sort of stuff in in, in production, uh, every time our service comes back up, we re-download the few shot set. And as as you know, of course, Will, but you know for the audience, what happens is the user asks a question, and because we've re-downloaded, let's say every week, a new set of a few shot examples which are correct and have been human corrected. Uh, what we're just trying to find are, you know, some examples that are similar uh, to the particular question in a particular schema, uh, in you know that the user is asking about. Uh, so we are we have been measuring, and we we measure a few things. Um, we were we were debating with you. I think you you've seen our document on this. Mm -hmm. uh, so we measure uh, like essentially the user satisfaction with these results. And what we found is, yeah, absolutely, like better few shot examples, better in context learning. Like for that particular user, uh, over time, like their experience will get get very much better. It's not great for generalization, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a particular user, I don't know for a particular type of 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 question and answer, the, the in-context learning works great. For generalization, well, at least what we found, there's no substitute to having either larger models or actually fine-tuning the model. Mm. I don't know if that's that really, 
that, that's a really good re response. Um, I've got a bunch more to follow up later. I'll ask one more question um, from the audience before uh, passing it over to Emil. Um, and this is that how does hierarchical structure work when you're extracting from PDF documents where maybe it's difficult to extract the right, the right type of structure and everything from there? I think this is a really common use case where people are taking in PDFs arbitrary from the web and then trying to do Q&A over it. This is a tailor-made question for Jean, maybe. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is what we've been working on since four years, Will. <laughs> That's my answer. It's a lot of work. Um, we have we are chaining a lot of LLMs and layout models. It's multimodal. Um, I mean, it's a lot of lot of work, the answer. That's why we actually uh, contributed to LangChain, our document loader, uh, so, so people can right. use it uh, with the APIs and all of this. So, Yeah, so I think the quick answer would be, and I know we're out of time, is when a PDF goes in and something like this comes out, uh, so it's XML, it's got labels, as well as it's got structure and the text, right? So this is what the hierarchical structure effectively looks like. Now you can run this yourself. And then we have some code, uh, it's open source, it's in 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 our Dakigami loader in Langchain, which essentially takes this uh, this XML format and comes up with chunks. So, you know, unlike other chunkers uh, who just might go by, you know, text or white space or something like that, uh, we, in our case, our chunks are hierarchical. So you literally might have a bigger chunk and then you might have like a little chunk inside it. And we've been doing this at this point, you know, for, for a while, but I think you folks added something recently, right? Uh, in Langchain. I think it's, uh, I, I forget the name, but you might know. There's a concept like this in Langchain 2 now, which is like bigger chunk, chunk. Yeah, the recursive chunker, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, there's recursive chunker and some of the parent document. Um, parent document one, exactly. The parent document chunker is the one I was thinking about. So it's conceptually very similar, except that we do it um, using you know the structure of the document uh, as well as the semantics of the document, if that makes any sense. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great response. I'm going to, in the interest of time, turn over the mic, uh, the metaphorical mic to Emil. And we've got a lot of other questions at the end. Um, so um, yeah, really excited to hear what you've um, prepared for us, Emil. I think the the mic isn't working right now. I might have to re reset a little bit. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Okay, perfect. Yes. Will, and thank you, um, Taki, and uh, the rest of the Dakigami uh, team. This was this was very helpful, and I didn't know about the Dakigami loader. I'm gonna have to look into it. I think we have a use case, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, my name is Emil and uh, I am with the WeChat. Uh, hopefully you guys are able to see my screen right now. So uh, essentially WeChat uh, is a software as a service solution uh, for real estate agents and brokerages. As of right now, they are using 10 to 20 different, uh, different tools uh, to get their work done. WeChat is a super app that allows them to do all of that in one app. Uh, the reason we are re relevant to this conversation is that we are creating Lucy, which is a real estate uh, agent's co-pilot. Uh, the idea behind Lucy is that uh, it's a co-pilot that can do anything that Richard can do, and there's a lot Richard can do. So uh, Lucy should be able to do a lot of things for the agents, including managing the CRM marketing, blah, 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 whatever the functionality is. Uh, so essentially, this fact that Lucy should be able to do many things uh, it means that it needs to have some reasoning capability uh, and it needs to have a structured output uh, calling. And for this, uh, essentially, the uh, main uh, agent that was created was Langchain's uh, structured chat agent. This was this was one of the first ideas behind Langchain and one of the first agents uh, that got a lot of traction. Uh, the structured chat agent allowed us to start building the features the infrastructure, blah, 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 everything that we needed to get the prototype and MVPs working. But the problem was it was way too slow to be usable because we had a lot of tools and the prompt would get so big and that also would contribute to very bogus structured outputs. So we were scratching our heads, like is fine tuning gonna be able to improve things so much or should we just have a different product direction because you may not be able to pull this up. That's when one really good thing happened for us, and that's when OpenAI announced the function calling capability. 
essentially function calling to us, it seems like that um, OpenAI people took everything that React frameworks offer, that is reasoning and structured outputs and embedded all of that into their language model. So with function calling, we had three to four times improved latency and a much more reliable structured output. This is still not perfect, but, uh, but it's still much more usable. Uh, the fact that OpenAI actually released this at the same time that we were looking at it gave us the confidence of, hey, the problems that we were having apparently are everybody else's, everybody else that is trying to build a similar thing. So at least they are on the right track. So that gives us a confidence boost that what, whatever we are doing seems to be, we are tackling the right problems at least. So at this point, using the, uh, the structured uh, agent within LangChain, we had created a lot of features on our client, a lot, a lot of the software components of it, the web, iOS, backend, blah, 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 everything was built. And now due to OpenAI functions, we uh, realized that the idea that we are working on is not feasible. However, it is not a polished experience yet. It is still uh, with misfire a lot and would, would hallucinate and blah, 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 all the issues that people have experienced. And this is where the real challenges uh, begun for us. Uh, the challenge of how to improve the performance of, uh, of your language model, even, even your use case. Now, generally speaking, there's two different uh, methods of improving your language model's performance. One is prompt engineering, one is fine tuning. For both of them, there is a big prerequisite, and that is for you to be able to measure uh, the, the, the performance you're extracting. Because if you can measure it, you obviously would, would not have an idea if you're actually improving things or not. You would be changing things without knowing if you are getting better. Uh, that's when we started to look into uh, to the options of how do we measure uh, our LLM. Uh, there, are, there are some different methods, for example, you hear a lot these days about evaluation frameworks. Uh, that turns out is not the exact thing we were looking for because they are dedicated to evaluating language models, not the applications that are built using language models. And if you are not building a language model, you're building the application that uses the language model. So I think evaluation frameworks, they're a wrong level of um, evaluation for us. Uh, we could have also looked at our user feedback, but at, at this point, they didn't have any users to get feedback from. And there was a chicken and egg problem because if we don't, if we couldn't make it much smarter, we couldn't release it to users. And if we couldn't release it to users, we couldn't get enough feedback. Uh, that's when we started looking at another option, and that is old-fashioned testing using CI/CD components that we all have used for years and years. Essentially, our idea was that we would create a pipeline that would test the different use cases for uh, for Lucy. Uh, the problem, as you all know, is that language models are not deterministic, even when you set the temperature to zero. Uh, so we would uh, create a test case to, for Lucy to do this. It may work sometimes. It may not work some other times. It would be uh, somewhat random. Uh, but the idea we had was that if we run a lot of tests, then we would get an idea, uh, a, a statistical idea, rather than a yes and no of if it's working or not, we would get on a statistical idea of if things are improving or not. Uh, so that would be in the, in the right direction. But having that data of, uh, of creating so many different cases would also require us to have users, which we didn't have. So we started looking into synthetically generated uh, test cases. That's one problem we had uh, about creating a pipeline of tests. And the second problem was that the existing test frameworks were not that suitable for this use case. For example, Jest is really focused on uh, front-end testing. Mocha is not able to handle uh, many concurrent tests, and we really needed to run hundreds of concurrent tests. Otherwise, each pipeline run would take like an hour or something, which wasn't uh, which wasn't good. And there's a lot of new tools and services being uh, introduced every day in this space, but we couldn't find any that was uh, very exact for our use case. Uh, so at that point, we thought about creating our own test runners and obviously how hard uh, this can be, right? So uh, I'm gonna skip all the uh, all the way that we ended up creating this, but I'll show you what we ended up. With. What we ended up with is a platform that allows us to generate a lot of test cases for a use case, like the one that you can see in this screenshot. 
we ask ChatGPT in a very manual way that, hey, create, uh, create user requests for this use case for me, create 50 of them for me, and give them to me in a JSON file format. Uh, we import them manually into our CI/CD, um, and then we run that CI/CD, and we get uh, and we get results of how each use case is running. This is, this is an actual screenshot from uh, our CI/CD. It shows that, hey, for example, for this UK use case, we've had this many tests, this many are uh, passing through, this many are failing, and we are continuously adding new assertions to find the new ways that our uh, language models can fail and adding them so that you're actually testing better and better. Uh, so in virtual respect, the measuring platform that we created makes it very, very easy for us to create new uh, test cases for each use case that we add to Lucy. And it's very easy for us to run those test cases. I think we have hundreds of cases that run under like three, four minutes every time you run the test. So it's very easy for us to make some changes, run them, see if it's getting better or worse. There were some mistakes. For example, we are still not sure if writing our own test runner was the right choice. It wasn't that difficult to create, but it would have been much better if we um, if we leveraged an existing platform. Node.js test runners may have been a very good choice for us, but for some reason we didn't use that. We may have to revert that back. And we should have probably leveraged Smith for this. Um, this predates Smith, so that's why we didn't, but we, in the future we should probably be switching to Smith. And I'll be explaining how Smith helps us in this context anyways. Uh, going forward. Now, with the measurement piece in place, now we had the capability to actually do some prompt engineering and improve the performance of our element. But before we could actually do some prompt engineering, it was very important for us to be able to do this fast and have a developer process and experience that makes it very easy for us to iterate through different problems, uh, find them, uh, find what why has something failed, reproduce it, change it, manipulate it, and repeat the process. Uh, so the development experience for this was very important for us. Imagine like not having hard reload and react, and how, how long it would take for you to develop something without that. That's, that's where Smith came to our help. Uh, essentially, we connected uh, our app to Smith under five minutes. It's super easy to do that. And once we did that, we started integrating more and more. For example, we started uh, sending tags like commit hash branch name, test suite name, blah, 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 everything to Smith. So it becomes easier and easier for us to take a look at a Smith and get an understanding of, uh, of what it is exactly that we are pushing to Smith. Uh, and then we added some integrations from the Smith to our, um, to our CI pipeline. For example, now anytime we have a, a test that fails, it puts a tiny link uh, under Smith, uh, under the failure uh, that links directly to the Smith uh, case. So we can click on it and get an understanding of what has failed, what exactly has failed, and, and get into the details. So it, it's very easy for us to take a look at the logs of a pipeline, see which tests have failed, click on them, get the details of the exact failure. And then there's a tiny little playground button uh, up on every Smith chain that you can click on. And it would load everything ready, all the prompts and functions and everything that you put together in that prompt for you to be able to reproduce it. This, this gives us a fantastic and beautiful developer experience because we can just click on a link of a fail test case, reproduce it using, uh, using Smith's Playground, make sure that uh, everything, uh, make sure it's reproducible and then start manipulating it, changing it, getting to a better prompt. And once we have a prompt that is working in this case, we can commit that prompt to our CI CD and have that uh, run against all of our test cases and get uh, the fantastic results back, hopefully. Uh, but this, this whole process would take only a few minutes for us to push something, go read the logs, reproduce them, fix them, blah, blah, blah. All of that becomes a, it becomes a process that happens in a matter of minutes uh, using Smith. So this is where Smith actually helped us get the fantastic um, developer experience for the prompt engineering that we wanted to do. But after that, we had the actual challenges of prompt engineering. Uh, because as mentioned, Lucy is 
is an agent that is supposed to do many things. It relies on open AI function calling. Uh, and by definition, uh, that's, that puts some constraints uh, on the things that you can do. First of all, uh, this open AI function calling is a process that requires your agent to make many, many different calls uh, to, the, to the language model before you can extract results. It's kind of an iterative process. And that means it's by nature somewhat slow. Uh, so techniques like breaking down a problem and running it in different prompts would make it even more slower. So that's usually a no-go for us because nobody wants to send a message to their uh, co-pilot and wait for two minutes to get an answer. So this needs to be a faster process. Uh, another challenge is that in open AI functions, uh, we can provide a lot of functions and those functions can have descriptions and JSON schemas provided to them. Uh, the language model does a very good job of following the schemas that is provided. Uh, however, if there is a mistake, you can, you, it doesn't really pick up the instructions that you give to it in terms of how to use those uh, schemas. So for example, we have a use case that um, the users ask for Lucy to write an email for them. Language model always puts a placeholder at the bottom of the email that says, uh, regards and the placeholders your name. And no matter how, how hard we try, we cannot get the language model not to do that. So the next step would be fine tuning or software patching that because uh, using prompt engineering techniques is kind of, it's somewhat difficult for us to communicate with the language model what to do and what not to do um, in functions. For example, it completely ignores few shot prompting in the tools, tool descriptions. And if you provide a lot of examples in the JSON schemas, that can lead to hallucinations more than it helps with actually doing the right thing. Uh, another thing we found that uh, is that OpenAI is not great with enumerations. Uh, in the functions that you pass to it, especially if those enums are somewhat uh, optional. But Langchain's handle parsing errors can help with this massively. We basically managed to reduce the number of issues we had in this to zero once we just turned the handle parsing errors uh, flag on, uh, on Langchain. Now, up until now, we covered what we've learned uh, in terms of prompt engineering and the developer experience that we managed to create for our prompt engineers. But as mentioned, there are some challenges that are not easy to resolve with prompt engineering alone. So the next step is for us to do fine tuning. Uh, because we rely very heavily on function calling and reasoning capabilities, and GPT models are known uh, to be best for those, we have never bothered with any other language models. So we doubled down on GPT models as of right now. Also, GPT-4 is extremely slow for us, again, because OpenAI function calling is an iterative process. With GPT-4, you have to call a language model many, many times. That makes it slow. So as of right now, we are limited to GPT-3.5. Uh, OpenAI announced fine-tuning for uh, GPT-3.5 uh, last month. Uh, so we were very excited about that because that finally allowed us to start fine-tuning our model and make it much more smarter. But as of right now, the GPT-3.5 fine-tuned models would lose their function calling uh, capability, uh, which is a huge part of um, what Lucy does. Uh, but they announced that in uh, later in fall, they're going to introduce uh, fine-tuned uh, function calling models. So where we are is that we are right now trying to create the pipelines, the processing, and everything uh, processes necessary uh, to build a pipeline so we have the data that we need. So when OpenAI uh, uh, announces fine-tuning uh, fine capabilities for uh, function calling models, we have everything ready to, uh, to essentially roll out a smarter version of our app. Uh, this is the process that we are creating right now. Uh, we are leveraging um, Smith for this again. So the idea is that you would have conversations with Lucy. Uh, which obviously uses the language model. Uh, when those conversations uh, go well, we put them in a Smith database called Good Samples. When they don't go that well, we put them manually in a database called Bad Samples. Uh, for the good samples, they are good, so we can we can essentially leverage them for fine tuning. But for bad samples, we would have our engineering team uh, start a curation process of looking into them, getting an understanding what has failed, 
uh, and then annotating and labeling uh, that data. So we can turn them into good samples uh, so that we can later find, uh, feed them back into the fine tuning model. One problem we have as of right now is that the tooling around these manual curations that our engineers would have to do is not there yet. So we are considering building some, but a lot of that already exists in Smith. So it's, a, it's always a challenge of finding what exactly you have to build in-house and what are the things that you can leverage from outside tooling. You're hoping that tooling in this space would, uh, would continue to, uh, to improve. Uh, some final thoughts around this is that what we find out is that the best practices are not really formed yet. Um, nobody is 100% sure what are the best practices in terms of creating a, a capable agent like this. The tooling is not there yet uh, as well, but it's moving extremely fast. Um, we are seeing improvements every day. We, uh, we had a miraculous moment where Smith showed up, otherwise you would have had to create a lot more manually and in-house. We'll be super glad it did, uh, but we expect a lot of more and better tooling to, uh, to show up for data annotation and manual curation and whatnot. Uh, also, one other th thing we know is that a lot of pieces that we have created so far in this whole pipelines that we've created uh, are probably going to be deprecated pretty soon. Uh, uh, so sooner or later, we are going to have a better pipeline, better test running, better this and better that. Uh, so to us, everything as of right now is temporary until a better solution comes in, and we would be glad to change everything. But we are going in this with, a, with an understanding of that the fact that everything is moving so fast in this area. Uh, one other thing we, we learned is that not everything needs to be 100% automated and scalable. Uh, for example, a part of our process is talking to ChatGPT and generating synthetic cases and importing that uh, those cases into our code base. That is not a super uh, automated process, but it works really well as of right now and it's scalable enough for us. Uh, and that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Uh, that's pretty much everything that we have learned in our journey to create a very capable uh, copilot. Awesome. Thank you, Emil. That was really exciting. I, I loved the takeaways around the different prompting techniques, what didn't work, um, and also the, the the shared thread with also the DocuCommy team on um, like thinking about fine tuning and trying to use it tactfully within your overall application and in a way that makes sense and that is d devoted to improving the service of your um, users. One question that I've seen a few people asking um, is around this whole process of trying to get the right training set or prepare it for fine tuning. Um, I know that you both sort of touched on some things about how you're thinking about organizing data sets and thinking about fine tuning. But I wonder if you could each, um, I guess, mention some of the, the, the key decisions that you've made or the key thoughts or open questions that you have there. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the biggest part is that we have to be really open-minded in terms of what we decide to do, because what we find out is that whatever we decide to do in two months time, it may be deprecated and there may be better ideas. So I think that the biggest one is let's stay open-minded and be ready to change. Uh, however, I think the biggest decisions we've made so far was that, hey, as of right now, and again, scalable enough is good enough. Uh, so as of right now, for example, I see people asking, how do we differentiate between, uh, between good and bad examples and whatnot? What we do is that we leverage our internal QA team. So we are having conversations with our, with our co-pilots hundreds, hundreds of times a day. And as of right now, there's a human making that decision that, hey, this was a good case. Like Lucy answered me well enough, so I'm gonna pay, uh, label this as a good example and put it in a good bucket. But if the response was not good enough, uh, I'm gonna put it in a bad examples uh, bucket. Uh, Lang chain evaluators, could be the next scalable options for us that we will rely on language models to do this. But as of right now, we want to have that human mentorship of the, of the compilement so, uh, so it's on the right track. Yeah, so for Dokigami, we sort of benefit from the fact that we've been doing this for five and a half years, you know? Uh, so, so there's some, uh, you know, some techniques that predate the, let's say the modern LLM era. Uh, so in the computer vision world, for example, uh, because we we look at documents as you know images and structures, etc. So in the computer vision world, there's actually pretty robust tooling in this area. 
so down to, uh, you know, identifying things like this, like bad examples, good examples, usually using other models, sort of teacher student models, right? Like the idea that I gave, uh, down to versioning your data sets. We found that's a critical thing. Like last week's data set versus, you know, last month's data set, et cetera. Sometimes data sets go wild and you have to revert back to an older data set. So I think we've benefited, uh, we use this tool. I love, you know, I love them. They're called V7 Labs. You know, they're pretty good, uh, you know, for our image, uh, data set management for for a text based sort of uh, data sets we're using Langsmith, and and will you know I've been sort of asking you for a few features, but roughly the way I think about it is, a, a you need robust data set management like I said versioning and what's a published data set what's a draft data set, you also need robust workflows, so uh, imagine there's a there's a run that comes in that needs to be fixed up like we said sometimes you can have a model help the annotator fix the run, uh, right? Like sort of assistant models. Then you need some sort of checks, like did somebody fat finger something? You also want a pipeline. What we found is super useful is having multiple eyes on it. So having an annotator, then having a reviewer, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of like a two eyes protocol, even if you use humans, one of those eyes can be a machine, right? Like a machine and a human. So I think there's, it's a very rich topic, but uh, personally, yeah, I'm excited to have Lang Smith uh, have a lot of these capabilities built in, like the the LLM evaluators are awesome as a start. But let's just say a few more things needed, uh, totally. and then we'd, we'd love to get get used and get you know be all over that. Totally, yeah, those are great points. Um, I think versioning is really key. Being able to put the um, put in some little L grease into labeling and making sure you get some some human supervision there, and using whatever tooling is really good for that in order to be reviewing. Uh, in that domain, so like, and thanks for the um, the the recommendation. There's set seven labs you said for the any yeah, the, it's V seven. I mean, they're gonna get a bunch of inbound now because of this mention. But yeah, they're 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 pretty good. You know, I love calling out good products. They're a small company. Uh, yeah, okay. they're but they're for image annotation. Now for NLP annotation, in the past we've also used Prodigy quite a bit. Uh, I I'd, I'd love to recommend them. They're by you know the Explosion AI folks. Uh, space the people who do Spacey. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. Uh, so Prodigy is absolutely amazing, and frankly, I would love to see some sort of a link up between, you know, a tool like Prodigy and a tool like Langsmith. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of great tools out there, essentially. So, yeah. Totally. Um, sort of related to the image part of it, um, someone asked how you're handling multimedia types of documents in Dokigami. How are you integrating this information with uh, the LLM pipeline? Yes, yeah, so I answered it partially in the chat, but let me just summarize and then maybe others want to jump in. Uh, so look, it's like we said, right? It, there's the document, but it's a complex beast. It's not just as simple as just a stream of text. Sometimes there's non-linear layouts, right? Like there's no linear representation of the document. Tables are a great example. You could have a floating box in the middle of the document, et cetera, right? So yeah, essentially it's a multi-pass approach as that, that's what I described. We first find these regions, like here's a tabular region, here's a figure, here's a chart. And then we take the text flow, the reading order, you know, around it so the LLM can operate on it. And then within a particular island, like a particular you know, table or whatever, we do further sub-processing. And it's it's complicated, right? Like I said, there's multi-column flow stitching things together, but then there's things like page headers and footers that you need to jump over, right? Uh, so you know, it's, a, it's the joke, right? Like documents, not text. Yeah. There is an additional even, you know, complexity, which is what we call the Z order, which is when we group documents that talks about the same thing, that's very important, right? Even if they look different, like if you take a different, I don't know, real estate uh, documents, or they just look different, mm -hmm. but they speak about the same thing. So our approach, and that's the XML data model, is to make sure those trees are labeled in the same, using the same label for every chunk and sub chunk. That's added, added an additional, you know, additional thing. So it's not only document by document, but it's just doc sets around the same documents in a category. Just a funny yeah. thing around that. I mean, this term that Jean mentioned, I mean, it's in our logo too, right? So documents are two dimensional objects, like particular document, but there's a third dimension, which is all the other similar documents. So uh, that's that's something I'd encourage the audience to to look into as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it seems like a lot of what you're pointing at is taking advantage of whatever your domain is. So it may not be a general for an LLM thing, but like whatever your domain is, and you leverage that domain knowledge in order to provide some sort of supervision, provide additional structure to your application, even in production, and use that in different steps of the pipeline in order to improve the overall quality for the end users. So really don't 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 like forget all this stuff that is unique to your domain whenever you're building a product. That's how you win. <laughs> exactly. Um, I guess one final question from the audience, uh, and, and it's pretty general, so I'll, I'll give it up to both of you, um, and then we'll we'll finish up. And I'm sure there'll be more questions after, uh, since there's a lot more content to share. The uh, like, what was like the, the single most uh, like the largest obstacle that you had to overcome in getting from the prototype to production? What was the single thing that you really had to do? Emil, do you want to start? Uh, I mean, that's a uh, that's a very abstract one and difficult to answer, but I think uh, getting the language model uh, to work is, uh, is easy enough, but getting it to work reliably for, for users to the level that they, they, have, they expect, that's a little bit difficult. So getting the level, that, that last two, three percent of quality that they expect, pushing it through that, that's the most difficult part. Uh, everything else is easier. I mean, for us, uh, because we, you know, very early on made the decision to have our own foundation model. Um, so I know a lot of demos I gave and the links, you know, are using OpenAI, et cetera, just so others can reproduce. But in in, in production, we have our own uh, foundation model. So I think performance and reliability, running it at scale across distributed nodes that fail. Uh, Mike, you want to say a few words about that? I think that's been for us the biggest challenge, the COGS. You know the cost of it. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, you you hit all the the high level points, but yeah, I mean, running these large ma you know models at scale and and keeping cost in mind, you know, is something that <laughs> I'll say is a continual area of investment for us. You know, <laughs> and and especially you know when you throw in things like dynamically having to scale things up and down based on usage. Um, uh it it yeah it just it's it's non-trivial you know certainly um you know and like like you know i know there are there are third-party services that offer things like this but uh for DocuGami, you know we've chosen for various reasons to host things locally and 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 so hence the investment in that space for us yeah, yeah, thanks, yeah custom, good customer data privacy is super critical yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. A lot of times you can't really be shoving this information over to external or third party API. Um, well, it looks like we're running out of time here. I just wanted to thank again all of our presenters here today. I think that we've got a lot of valuable insights from this and um, looking forward to following up with other things to share afterwards. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. No, thank, thank you. All. you thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.